Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. So please, please go ahead. Okay. So first of all, I wanted to say a big thank you to Imri and Brian for, and all of you for the next 20 minutes for being patient and listening to a talk uh, coming out of a computer. You know, I'm not actually there in flesh and blood. Um, I also wanted to apologize that I couldn't be there in person. I'm uh, teaching a new course this quarter as well as commissioning two new instruments. One that you may have heard about, the Swiki Transit Facility, as well as a white field infrared imager at Palomar. So it's, an, it's a really busy time. So I apologize in advance for not being there in person. Uh, but I've been listening to all of you very carefully um, and very quietly for a change. Um, so, and, uh, and I've been learning a lot um, over the past three and a half. So, um, so, that's, um, so that's great. So you'll finally hear what I have to say to some of the things that were presented in, in the next 20 minutes. Okay, um, so for some of this talk, I need to put on a different hat. And this is the hat of the, uh, as a member of the Science Advisory Committee to LSSC. Uh, where there are heated discussions on this topic, including you know, whether we should pursue uh, electromagnetic counterparts or just gravitational waves at all. And but then after you get the yes on that, then you move on to how and all the details, which is, um, which is what uh, you know, this workshop is all about. And um, with a project of this scale, um, you know, many, many different efforts are needed to, um, to make some science that is a deviation from the standard happens. So I wanted to just say, I really do appreciate efforts from, say, Rafaela and others who write white papers on this topic. They all helped make the case much stronger here. Um, so, um, so the first thing that I wanted to say was um, that uh, in terms of the details of the observing strategies for LSSD, uh, the most important thing in my mind is that we should try to make this decision as late as possible. So wait as long as possible so that we can make the most informed and most strategic decision possible. And the reason I say this is that, um, as has been alluded to um, in the past day, um, there are, the physics of what is happening here is very, very rich. Uh, there are many, many papers on predictions of various types of electromagnetic emission at a whole range of wavelengths, at a whole range of time scales. Um, and this PowerPoint cartoon that I made is just a summary of um, um, a, a cartoon sketch. Um, and there are many sources of optical emission in addition to what is traditionally referred to as a kilonova, uh, which is the radioactive decay of the heavy elements uh, produced by uh, the R process and the dynamical debris in this case, which is responsible for the torus, but there's also possibility for the disk wind emission, free neutron decay. But uh, the complications that surround this very rich physics can be summarized as, you know, there should be a blue flash and a red transient. So something fast in the bluer wavelength, something slower in the redder wavelength. Um, so I heard Brian, um, you know, the audio quality is not best, but I think I heard Brian trying to make point about um, this uh, model on the left um, with uh, escape of um, escape and beta decay of free neutrons, um, giving you a blue flash um, on the time scale of hours. But I think his point did not get through at least to Tony Tyson's talk, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, just to make sure that everybody is aware of Brian's models here and what they actually mean. Um, so, um, and in this context, I mean, if there is something that's fading on past time scales, that is something that we are capable of finding right now. You know, I mean, LSSD doesn't, is not required for um, constraining or, or testing these sorts of models. And um, here's again just a schematic of how we can do this today. I mean, um, I'm going to put up my favorite telescopes, which are part of um, this global relay of observatories to try and characterize transients uh, that could be electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational waves. Um, our discovery engine is at Palomar. And right now, in fact, last night was the first night that we um, took our uh, Zwicky transient facility camera, put it on the Palomar 48 inch, and collected the first photons, hit our CCDs last night. So it's a very, very exciting time right now. It's, it's not broken. It's <laughs> okay, so we are in commissioning phase right now. 
Um, and then, but uh, the problem with uh, our time scale is that the rotation of the Earth matters. And not only do you need to respond quickly to the cyber triggers, but you need to go around the globe to characterize these events within 24 hours. And this sort of thing is very doable. I mean, we've done it time and again, multiple times now, uh, where we've uh, gone imaged large areas, picked out which are our most highest priority candidates, um, gotten spectra, light curves, <coughs> classified them, and said that we don't have a plausible optical counterpart to gravitational waves. So this is a very, very much doable problem that if there is something that is you know, brighter than 24 hours, um, we have gone and uh, done this 24 hour um, response, not only in, um, in the optical, but also with multi wave and follow up to characterize. So it's, it's, it's a tough problem, but it's, it's, it's a tractable problem and it's becoming more and more tractable as um, uh, software algorithms are getting more sophisticated and follow-up campaigns are getting more systematic and more coordinated. Um, but back to Brian's models here. So Brian's models for the neutron precursor, I show in black the G-band models and in the red the R-band models, which are the filters that we um, will baseline for this wiki transient facility. We also have an I-band filter. Um, and this 24-hour time scale is what I mark as relevant. And Brian here sent me both a, you know, a pessimistic, an optimistic, and a, and a median model for a range of parameters. Um, there's, of course, an uncertainty in terms of the fraction of free neutrons that would escape. Uh, but you can see from this depiction that this entire phase space can be constrained adequately by one to two meter class telescopes. Um, you don't need an analysis to solve the problem unless the fraction of free neutrons is lower than 2% or the opacities are so high that not even 2% of free neutrons don't escape. So LSST's role really comes in if all these efforts in the next five years you know, fail to find a counterpart, or don't always find a counterpart to um, neutron star, black hole mergers, and neutron star, neutron star mergers. Of course, this is assuming that in the next five years we have a statistically significant sample of, um, of mergers to follow up from LIGO. And um, right now, the, 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 the stand is zero detection. But just remind everybody, we have exactly zero neutron star, neutron star, neutron star black hole mergers from LIGO. Uh, but the future is bright. The future is optimistic. The distance that I've put here is, is uh, the projected distance for O3. Um, right now, LIGO is at 75-ish megaparsec. Um, and I'm told they can go somewhere 120, maybe 150, depending on how their own commissioning goes um, in the next year. So, um, so just uh, to emphasize, I mean, there is this fast fading blue emission, which I think LSC cannot do much about. But then there is a slower time scale redder emission, um, which is where LSC can play a very important role. Um, the light curves that I show here come from, again, a variety of different um, papers, um, theoretical papers. Um, and from you know different uh, theory groups as well. You know, there's the Berkeley group, there's the Los Alamos group, there's the European group, um, the Squeeze group, um, so on and so forth. Um, but these are all put on the same plot with the same assumptions in ejector mass and ejector velocity. So these are all for ejector masses of 0.01 solar masses and ejector velocities of 0.1 the speed of light. Um, now, LSSD's role would be, I mean, even in, even at K-band, you know, these are really bright. So you don't need an LSSD to, to look for the, the red emission unless the ejector masses are very small. So if instead of 10 to the minus 1 or minus 2 solar masses, you are 10 to the minus 3, minus 4 solar masses, uh, or you're not as relativistic as you may have uh, previously thought, then again, it's, it's a, the depth of LSSD plays a key role. Okay. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the past day about the filter, um, so I just wanted to put this um, uh, plot up, and um, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for the Y-band filter, which really surprised me actually, because no matter which model you make this plot for, um, and this is again one of these 0.01 solar masses, 0.1 C models, uh, the Z minus Y color is not very significant actually, it's pretty flat in this region. Um, of the first three days. It starts to become redder beyond three days, between three and 11 days, but again, not, not very significantly. 
And I just wanted to remind people that you know, uh, LSST is using silicon-based detectors, and they have a very hard band gap at one micron. So even though they're beautiful, these depletion devices, there's just nothing you can do about the quantum efficiency in Y-band. Um, so there needs to be a lot of careful thought on, on the decision between Z-band and Y-band. And I was a little bit surprised uh, that the you know, message communicated to Tony Tyson was that you know, Y band is the band to, uh, to begin searching with even. So, um, so we should exercise a little bit of caution there and uh, just run the numbers and fold in the quantum efficiency and the physics of the detectors that is being used in um, LSSD. And the actual Y band, by the way, extends well beyond one micron. The only seeing about half to two thirds of the of the Y band with a silicon based detector. You just need different semiconductors to push beyond one micron. Okay, um, so I think this point has been made. The volume is within easy reach for LSSD. Um, so I'm just going to move, move right to the head. Um, to this needle in the haystack problem, which keeps a lot of people up at night. Um, and how do you actually reduce the number of false positives with LSSD? Um, I was specifically assigned the task by Brian and Imbri to talk about nearby galaxy catalogs um, and how they can be used as a way to, um, as an effective filter. You can see that from 127,000 number of catalogs in a random image, if you lim limit yourself to those that are coincident with a nearby galaxy, you're down to a thousand. So even with the real numbers here, it's a 1% reduction in false positives, just because the solid angle of nearby galaxies is so, so small. Um, so I wanted to start with this idea for an on-the-fly galaxy catalog that Imri wrote a paper about in 2015. And uh, the point that Imri was making here was that it is so easy to find out where all the plausible host galaxies are within 200 megaparsec, that you could just do it on the fly. Yeah, um, I think he said something like you need a day with uh, with PTF or a few days with MDM, um, given the fields of view and sensitivity of these telescopes, to just go and image the LIGO error circle and identify all of the individual host galaxies that could plausibly host your transient. And then you can use this in two ways. You can use this to go and point at one galaxy at a time. If you have a narrow field of view EM follow-up telescope, as is the case right now, say in the X-rays, where um, unless we, uh, until we have a wide field telescope, we're limited to uh, pointing one galaxy at a time with this. Um, or you could just use this as a way to reduce your false positives and figure out which transient you want to actually go and get a spectrum of. And in the context of LSSC, this is an even more expensive proposition, right? I mean, the transients that, you, that uh, LSSC is going to be finding are going to be so faint that you'll be requiring even larger glass to try and get that, that precious spectrum. So anything that you can do to prioritize or um, increase the probability of success in getting the spectrum um, of an LSSC candidate is, is very, very important. And galaxy catalogs are 1% um, filter, so they are a very severe and a very effective filter. Um, so uh, now I wanted to talk about the efforts we have. We are doing at Palomar, where um, you know this on-the-fly galaxy catalog is, is a great idea. But uh, why not at least try to make a head, to get a head start by just imaging the entire sky in narrowband filters in advance. Um, so let me explain the concept of narrowband filters, uh, since I noticed there are some some um, LIGO people in the room as well. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page here. Um, so the idea uh, behind narrowband filters is that um, galaxies, even if they have a little bit of star formation, uh, will emit um, each alpha emission, which is directly proportional to the amount of star formation that they have. And the position of this very narrow H alpha line will move between uh, from here at redshift zero to somewhere on the right um, for redshift 0.05 or 200 megaparsec. So if you had images in narrowband filters, um, you could get a proxy for the distance to the galaxy by figuring out that, say, in this particular galaxy's case, you see nothing at 65, 63 angstroms 
but you see a booming galaxy at 6630 angstrom. This tells you, and then you don't see anything in Chukumo filters that are redder than this. So this tells you right away that this galaxy must be in this uh, redshift range of roughly 0 0.017 plus or minus a little bit, right? We are based on the width of the filter here. Um, so you can get a rough estimate of the redshift. And if you can do this for the entire sky, which is what we've been doing for the last seven years, um, every time during full moon, we've been using four narrowband filters. And you can see the transmissions here. Um, and uh, we've been covering the entire northern sky, that is 3 pi of the sky, in four narrowband filters from redshift 0 to redshift 0 0.048, which is uh, almost 200 megaparts. Today. Um, and the idea is that just looking at which galaxies are in one filter, bright in one filter, and faint or not detected in the other three filters, we can find out and make a more complete catalog of nearby galaxies. Um, so I'm very um, uh, happy to report that we made a lot of progress in analyzing this data as well. All the data is collected, by the way. Uh, we have all the data in hand for 3 pi of the sky and over four filters. And we have our first um, uh, you know, several thousand candidates already um, in these data. So here are some examples. Um, you know, very easily, very trivially, we can see little blue galaxies uh, that are uh, uh, that are very high star formation. So here, this one is in um, at redshift 0.03. This one is at redshift 0.04, and that's where it emits in this filter, but it's quiet in the others. Uh, but these are very active star forming galaxies. And as we heard in uh, Swiss talk yesterday, uh, dwarf galaxies are, are perfectly reasonable possible hosts um, for uh, neutron star mergers. Um, he explained that beautifully uh, yesterday to all of us. Uh, but you might be surprised that it's not just dwarf galaxies that uh, astronomers don't know about in their local neighborhood. Uh, there are some pretty big galaxies, uh, I mean, galaxies that are nearly an arc minute in size um, that are missing even in the Sloan footprint. I mean, the Sloan, is a, uh, the Sloan is still sky survey is a beautiful survey. They have taken spectra of so many galaxies. Um, they have really made a huge dent in, in um, com completing our catalog of nearby galaxies. So if, but even within the Sloan footprint, it's almost embarrassing that we still don't know that such big, beautiful nearby galaxies, even in the, rest, in the second filter here, this is the redshift of only 0.01, um, are, are previously unknown and uncatalogued. So, um, so we are finding some, some big galaxies, some little galaxies, a wide range of star formation. Um, and uh, we've, we've now completed this analysis over the entire Sloan footprint. Um, so there's a postdoc, uh, David Cook at Caltech, who's hard at work, and he has finished the analysis of uh, assembling all the candidates uh, nearby galaxies in the Sloan footprint. Um, now, applying this to the problem at hand, right? Um, I know I'm not supposed to say anything about the ongoing LIGO run, uh, but I'm going to say something anyway, which I think Hopefully, Peter, I don't get into trouble for this. Um, but <laughs> I think it's public now that like we sent a few triggers out to EM groups. Um, so I'm just giving an example of one trigger where we looked inside this error volume um, for the top 20 galaxies, the, the 20 most most likely candidate hosts of these neutron star uh, modules or whatever the module in this case. Uh, the natures are unknown, and there's no, um, but whatever the top 20 um, um, most probable hosts are by, sorted by star formation or stellar mass. And uh, in one of them, I mean, in one such search, which is what I'm giving you an example of, out of these 20, there were three clue galaxies which were previously unknown to be in that uh, LIGO error volume. And this is an error volume which is much closer now because of the sensitivity limit of the LIGO detectors. And here's a beautiful example of one of these three galaxies. Um, it's actually a triplet. It's an interacting uh, triplet of galaxies. And it even goes to the supernova a few years ago. The supernova has nothing to do with the LIGO signal. I just want to make that very clear. But it means that the star formation that the mass is high enough and interesting enough that um, that uh, it, it gives you rates such that you find the supernova if you're looking at the field for a few years. Um, 
And then this is a more detailed plot for those of you interested in more of the details here. Um, so David Cook, um, who's the postdoc I was telling you about, has done his deep drill down of this preliminary set of fields to quantify our completeness um, relative to SPSS. So some of you might remember this is the completeness of SPSS at the 17.8 mag. Spectroscopic completeness of SPSS is 17.8 mag. But even brighter than that, we are finding a large number of um, galaxies. So the uh, red and blue dots are the galaxies that uh, uh, we pick up in our H-alpha survey. And the ones marked with the black X are the ones that um, are newly discovered local galaxies. So it's too, uh, much, I mean, we thought we'd find things you know, below the Sloan limit if you're looking in the Sloan field, but we are finding many, many galaxies even brighter than the Sloan limit. Um, which are just previously uncatalogued and not known to be in this uh, redshift range. Uh, so there's a, there's a treasure trove of nearby galaxies here to be found. Um, those of you interested in the completeness question, um, you can think of completeness of this catalog in terms of star formation or stellar mass. Uh, this is where we are. We are at an HR luminosity of 39.5 right now, based on this deep drill down. And I think we can do a little bit better because uh, we can do some stacking and improve this even more. But in terms of star formation, we are well above 90%, no matter what proxy you use. Um, we are getting everything on the right of this line that you see here. I don't know if you can see my cursor on and on. Um, in terms of stellar mass, we are not as sensitive, not surprisingly. We only get down to about 40, 45%. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not a problem because um, in terms of stellar mass, existing catalogs are already very, very complete. Um, most of that stellar mass is actually in bright, um, massive elliptical galaxies um, that don't have much each alpha, but are already there in existing catalogs. Um, so, so this is not as bleak as one may think at first blush. And in terms of star formation, we are making a huge step forward in completing um, our catalog of nearby galaxies. So this is my final slide, um, which is that um, you know, whenever we are searching for electromagnetic like, counterparts to gravitational waves, um, caution is a better part of valor. You know, it could be fast, it could be red, it could be temporally coincident with the LIGO signal, it could be spatially coincident, it could even be next to a nearby galaxy at exactly the right distance, but it could still be unrelated to that gravitational wave trigger. And in the words, words of Bob Kirshner, the spectrum is true. So, um, so let's not shy away from getting a full pan chromatic picture of whatever candidates we put forward because any, any great thing uh, would need to be backed up by some great evidence. And uh, that's all. Thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take some questions if the audio cooperates. Monty, if you don't hear the questions, I'm going to translate. Um, is there any questions? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to ask an yeah, uncomfortable yeah. question, which is the public availability of, the, of this catalog. Uh, and, and is it going to be, uh, sorry, Monty, <laughs> is it going to be uh, published? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Brian, I think that was you, right? That was Brian, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. I can recognize some voices, but not all. So, um, so in terms of public availability, so I have this very brave post, you have to see his picture and put it up. His name is Dave Cook. Um, uh, oh, I don't know if that is. Okay, now maybe you can see him. Um, but uh, he's uh, going to, so on the preliminary field, where he's done a deep drill down, um, we have gotten confirmation of every single galaxy. So in the paper that he's about to submit, so he's made his report that he has submitted in the next couple of weeks, um, he'll release those um, galaxies as well. So the, there'll be the first data release of flu should be within the first, um, within a month at most, I would say. Um, and so, in terms of the full data release, uh, the, uh, the right now the main limitation is uh, this is you know uh, we need to do much more vetting of the catalog before we release it. So, um, so we need to be confident that um, uh, that uh, we've done all of the reliability checks and quality checks. And um, this might require additional funding, um, which I do plan to apply for in the fall, because I think it's a little bit too much to ask from a postdoc uh, to take on this task single-handedly. He's been very brave and worked very hard so far. Um, so if I'm able to raise some additional funds, um, I'm, I'm actually very happy to release this 
um, integrated with NET, uh, and I've been talking to some people at NET, which is hosted at um, IPAC, which is just next door to me, um, on methods by which you know some uh, quality checks can be done, reliability checks can be done, and it can be released through the same system as NET. Um, but I think that will take um, a little bit more fundraising, a little bit more time. But I think it's doable on a few year time scale. Thank you. Uh, Rahul? What is the time frame by which the spectrum trigger must be generated given the setup available resources? I, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think it depends on um, on which model is actually, um, you know, how quickly that light curve is fading. Uh, let me go back to that light curve um, assembly plot so we can uh, talk about this in a more informed manner. So say um, you're only trying to get an infrared spectrum, right? Um, in K-band, almost all the models, if I different groups, you know, the red is the Salamos, the dashed is Europe, uh, the dashed dotted is Europe, and dashed is um, Berkeley. Uh, in K-band, the light curves evolve relatively luxuriously on almost a week time scale. So there you have the you have the luxury of time. Um, if you're trying to get an optical spectrum, you don't have much time at all. Then you only have a few hours <laughs> to try and get that spectrum before it becomes so faint that it's impossible to get a spectrum with the um, with the contentment of that that is going to be for the ELT. Uh, Savi has a question. Yes, hi. Uh, wonderful talk. So uh, when you say uh, spectrum is truth, um, how good the spectrum should be to qualify for truth? Um, that's you know that's another interesting question, right? I mean, um, one worry that I have about the spectra right now is that if the velocities are indeed that high, they are 0.1 um, p, then the spectral features will all be washed out and will be so broad that they, they will actually not be very revealing at all. Um, so, uh, so I would say, I mean, we sh we should take what what we have. Um, if we uh, in terms of um, spectral energy distribution, at least the spectrum, the spectrum should be something that you've never seen before, right? I mean, the spectrum should be, even if it's just made up of 6.6 .6 broadband filters, it's a poor spectral energy distribution instead of a proper uh, uh, R of thousands or so uh, spectrum. Um, there should at least be enough in that to tell you that, um, that it was very different from anything that we've ever seen before. Um, so. It'll be great to actually see some lines, right? Actual line emission from some of these heavy elements in land tonight. That to me would be the ultimate proof. Um, but um, I don't know if that's actually doable. Maybe a JWSB spectrum or something that would have lines that would be just tell you that this chemistry, astrochemistry here is right. And, um, uh, but that's such that a dreaming at this point. So can I make one comment about that, which is that, you know, it's definitely true that the bulk of the ejecta is very fast, and that's what's producing most of the emission at the peak. I think the way, you know, if we got a spectrum then, the lines would probably be very broad. Uh, if we can take spectra later when it's decaying, which I understand would require better facilities, deeper, uh, strong, uh, larger glass, uh, the, the lines should get narrower because all of our models do predict a distribution of velocities that go all the way down to much less than a tenth of the speed of light. Uh, so I think right. that it really matters is you know sort of how how late can we get a spectra you know with the right resolution? It's kind of a trade off. Yeah. Right. You know the dream spectrum would be a nebula spectrum, right? I mean, right. all the mess is gone. You just left with the lines. It's awesome. I mean, so for that, I mean, we need Brian's model to be right, so that <laughs> we have a bright signal, we can localize it, and then we can get this late time nebula spectrum, which is still, and it's still doable within. Uh, with it not reasonable, within with existing facilities, it's not too too far out to dream. So, Mansi, is there any more cataloging, or are you uh, satisfied with this current uh, completeness? Um, so, the, this is limited to the uh, northern 3 pi. Mm -hmm. So, if somebody has a telescope in the south and can do the southern pi, I would be very grateful. That would be the biggest improvement, I would say, right now. Right now, the Southern Pi is dominated by um, 60s, the 60s survey that was done. Um, and it's just, it's not deep enough. Mm -hmm. So if somebody can 
make up a thing with us the whole two days and for calling in. Sure, for thank you, Henry, for thank you. I hope the audio was understandable. It was perfect, yep. very nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the video. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, thank you. So um, we're done with the little talk. So uh, it's so um, so Sabi, you suggested that um, maybe it's a little short time now with uh, travel plans to have an extended discussion on next step. But so I, I think maybe what's important to uh, um, to emphasize that you know we, we got more informed about the science case and what needs to be done for uh, uh, the LSST gravitational wave joint science goal. But uh, hopefully this is not just for us and. Uh, uh, what we also read that the community needs to be uh, motivated and um, essentially important about uh, this plan uh, to make this happen. It may not happen otherwise that easily. So it would be very useful to uh, not keep this information in this room, but to um, uh, have a, a, some form of statement that is available to the community. So um, what we were going to suggest is that we uh, make a document of uh, what we've learned here uh, with the participation of hopefully all of you and we make that available in some format uh, to um, LSST, uh, primarily because they have to decide on, on uh, uh, what they're gonna follow up, what they're not gonna follow up, but hopefully uh, there are uh, lots of other people who are interested in the science case, so. Um, Can I interject yes, here? So yes. I was really excited to see Rafaela's um, uh, talk because um, you know, since you and, and the other people in that group are already thinking very much about this, that's, I, 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 I'm very glad to hear that, and so, I wonder what you want to know. I mean, you've already thought about this a lot, and maybe one way or the other, you can help, kind of help uh, direct the, the questions and investigations. Yeah, I mean, uh, Peter, that's, that's a great idea. So I, I think uh, the idea was that all of us will edit this document. So I, th yeah. I think I think Rafaela will be in there directly. Yeah. So yeah. so I think I think that's that's perfect. Okay. And we would be happy to post the document on the other uh, Awesome. Yeah. yeah, so I think LU also mentioned spe specific um, formats or, or uh, ways to, to host that essentially. Yes, Tony was telling me that if we can uh, like write a document and tell them what would be the, the labels that they can use for image specification, uh, we can iterate what would be really useful. <coughs> okay, okay, very good. Um, so um, I think there, you know, this is, if you write a document like this, it's not something that uh, one person can do for sure. It's a very uh, a broad science topic. So hopefully um, many of you will participate in the actual writing of this document. Everybody. Um, you everybody, might receive yes. emails from yes. this. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yes. uh, so uh, very nice. And so in, in uh, the interest of time, um, uh, we actually have some wine here, but Siyong, so you wanted to. Is there gonna be another one of these meetings next year? That's a good idea. We, we, we can, um, you know, uh, I think for writing a document like that, we don't want to wait another year, but I think it would be good to <laughs> revisit this topic um, uh, oh, later on. So I think this discussion was very useful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, it, it, was, it was very encouraging. So yeah, yeah. we are motivated to keep working. Yeah, uh, Elio. Uh, just wanted to say the astronomers are really interested in uh, exploring these new things for deep learning. We hosted an NVIDIA deep learning at NCSA recently, and we would be happy to host another one with a specific target in mind. Like, for example, let's develop a neural network that is going to detect after mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can bring your data and we train the, the network there in real time and see how it is performing. So, if, if there is interest, I can organize that at NCSA. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. That's, That's very cool. interesting. Yeah. Really yeah. Cool. So we don't catch you on that. You are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, but again, the, the bottom line is we have some wine ready for uh, more more discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. uh, maybe so, again. So uh, even can I just since please. this is the last time we are sitting here without wine. So, so I would like to, to to thank uh, thank the local organizers uh, uh, and 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 uh, our our note taker students to to take. They should stand up at least, right? And yeah. Can you please stand up and uh, and we are really appreciating. Thank you.